Many people considered 2020 the worst year of their life or the year from hell. Consider how that perspective may be aiding in creating the conditions you say you don't want. Maybe we can use the fire of suffering to sharpen our sword so we can fight future battles with more courage and strength. Quote, Within every adversity is an equal or greater benefit. Within every problem is an opportunity. Even in the knocks of life, we can find great gifts. End quote. These following 12 lessons are some of my gifts, are some of the opportunities and the benefit within the adversity that I have found. Number one, we are too dependent on large corporations for our livelihood and well-being. It is clear how vulnerable the supply chain is to disruption from a systematic global level and an idiosyncratic individual level. To circumvent this, the individual should establish their own autonomy and independence by reducing their dependency on global infrastructure, improve provisions, and have local means of producing and sourcing essential food and medicine. Each individual can take steps towards made-in-your-own-country goods and services and support local community businesses to source their food, clothing, and essential items. Number two, Team Human. This pandemic was not yet damaging enough to destroy our world, but bad enough to cause long and consequential global damage. Short of an alien attack, it is one of the few catastrophes that could make all the humans in the world feel like they're on the same team fighting against a common enemy. At least it felt like that for a moment anyway, and it invigorated a feeling that we are all on team human. Number three, money is like oxygen. A huge amount of people are suddenly told they can't go to work for months on end. Most of these people are dependent on that recurring income to keep them afloat. Suddenly, money doesn't buy happiness. Money buys the mental space to not feel anxiety, anger, and depression about whether you can pay your rent, feed your family, or whether you have to move back in with your parents. Money is like oxygen. You need enough of it where you don't have to think about it. But as soon as you don't have enough, you can't breathe, and all you can think about is getting some oxygen. Prepare for the uncertain future by building a backup of savings that can last three to six months to support basic living expenses. If you don't know how much money is coming in and out, start recording it ASAP. Manage your money like it's your children's future life fund and you'll be able to breathe more freely during the next disaster. Number four, relying on the just-in-time delivery system is a bad idea. Always have backups. Many are still experiencing major delays one year into this pandemic. We have become extremely reliant on the global delivery network system to support our lives and we are left vulnerable when that system is damaged. If something is essential to your livelihood and well-being, have a backup of it. Quote, two is one and one is none. Always have a backup. End quote. Number five, anything can be taken away from you at any moment. We have very little control over outside circumstances, but we can control how we prepare for guaranteed unpredictability. We have learned that our profession, businesses, availability to food, ability to freely move around our city, and for some, even access to basic utilities can all be taken away at a moment's notice. Fight against your cognitive dissonance and understand this will not be the only time in your life that you will be left vulnerable, out of control, and fearful for your life. Develop contingency plans such as growing your own food, like a vegetable garden, getting chickens, investing in backup solar-powered electricity, owning months of non-perishable food, the ability to filter water, owning camping equipment, Developing emergency preparedness plans in case of natural or non-natural disasters. Number six, isolation highlights the importance of our connection with the natural world. When everyone is told they must stay inside, they quickly realize how magnificent it is to go outside. Nature and animals that inhabit this planet support our life. It's a good idea to live in cooperation, collaboration, and respect for them. Number seven. This is not a once-in-a-lifetime event. This is a practice run for something more serious. Assuming something worse will occur in our lifetime acts as a safeguard to mentally and physically prepare ourselves. Whether something worse actually happens in our lifetime is not important, or not as important, as orientating our behavior towards the acknowledgement that something more destructive is coming at some point. 
while there is a very high probability for humanity to survive a single catastrophic event, over time, there is eventually zero probability of surviving repeated exposures to such events. If no one will survive, what does it matter anyway then? You see, before the last event that ends a species, there is usually an innumerable number of other damaging events that affect the populace. Preparation for these events is like putting your seatbelt on in case of a car crash. Whether that car crash will be fatal to our species or you individually, we will not know until it occurs. So what are some possible car crashes that could face humanity? Let's not just consider the natural predation of viruses, but also man-made biological viruses engineered by terrorist organizations who at some point may have access to the personnel and technology to create and distribute a biological weapon that could wipe out millions. This is a potential reality that some say increases in probability as time and technology continue to advance. But as a thought experiment, take a moment to consider all the other multitude of serious disasters that could reshape humanity. Asteroids, solar flares, nuclear warfare, nanotechnology, natural disasters, artificial intelligence. Are you physically prepared for any of those events? Maybe, maybe not. What about mentally prepared? Have you considered what you would do when one of those events occurs or gets out of hand and turns into a disaster? Number eight, we're not all going through the same or even a similar experience. Each city is experiencing a different sized battle wound from this virus. Every city responds differently to the battle wounds. Some let the body heal itself, while others put every effort forth to make sure a cut doesn't become an infection. The severity of the virus and a city's set of restrictions pressure tests its population. However, each city is being pressure tested differently, resulting in vastly different interpretations and judgments of this pandemic. If hard times make hard people, then there are still many cities and countries going through easy times due to light restrictions perhaps as a result of their success or lackadaisical approach. And so not everyone will learn similar lessons from this experience. Number nine, humans are generally inefficient and inconsistent at assessing risk. From the wide scope of inaccurate predictions and models, which is expected, to people digging their head in the sand of cognitive biases, to people over-dramatizing the severity of risk, every decision has shades of gray and degrees of risk. We forget this. For example, the 14-day quarantine rule has a risk still because that duration represents a 95% statistical distribution, but about 2.5% of people are still infectious after 14 days. And we know masks, they don't eliminate your risk, they simply reduce it. These examples highlight the degrees of error and wide distribution of risk during this pandemic. Risk is relative and contextual. Blanket statements, assumptions, and beliefs that don't consider relative risk are relatively inaccurate and likely overestimated. Example, a 20-year-old with no unhealthy lifestyle risk factors or medical conditions approaching COVID-19 more seriously than the average 65-year-old with prior health conditions on the surface does not seem to represent an evidence-based judgment of risk. Those two demographics are at opposite ends of the spectrum of statistical risk. Once the emotion is taken out of their assessment, their risk should scale accordingly to those individual differences. However, this is not an idiosyncratic problem, meaning it affects one person. This is a systemic, meaning this affects many people. I can affect you, you can affect me. Thus, one's risk must be adjusted based on the context and environment of the individual and who they are in contact with. Regardless, the application of relative risk from a basic first principles line of thinking should be established first and applied to assessments of action to regulate risk more accurately. Number 10, people need more than information to care. Knowledge alone is not enough to motivate. Information without feeling is largely ineffective. Our unwillingness to change our minds based on information alone can lead in the opposite direction. Many people remain fearful or less willing to fly, even though statistically it's incredibly safe. 
many people remain skeptical of the severity or risk of an event until it impacts them or someone around them and establishes an emotional connection that makes it viscerally real. 11. Pandemics tend to be cyclical and operate in waves. While the amplitude of each wave is dependent on numerous variables, it is expected the same country and or state will experience one to two waves each year until herd immunity is attained. It's important to highlight this to modulate your expectations that after one set or two sets or three sets of waves, that there may be another one and another one and another one. You are not out of the woods just because you've cut yourself and that wound has partly healed. You are likely to get cut again until you stop doing what is cutting you or changing your environment that is cutting you. So why are some reasons pandemics operate in a cyclical fashion? A. As cities ease restrictions, social mixing is increased and the potential for the infected to spread their virus in additional environments more suited for transmission, is heightened. B. Winter and summer months influence social behavior and more social mixing, or less so. And relative humidity of the air impacts spreadability of a virus. C. History. The 1918 pandemic experienced a second wave much more deadly than the first wave. This doesn't mean we are destined to repeat history, but history acts as a guide for a potential future reality. These are some reasons to highlight why pandemics operate in a cyclical fashion and to remind ourselves that it may not be the last time. Number 12, how government and societal structure influences emergency response capabilities. How a population of people prioritize freedom, liberty, and choice is a significant factor in the adherence to government regulations. An example of freedom being diametrically opposed to human well-being and life are countries like China, they dealt with the virus in a very aggressive, totalitarian, but seemingly effective way, primarily due to their authoritarian government and generally docile population. It's a lot harder to function as a black sheep in a country like China. On the other hand, countries like the United States have a very independent system where individual liberty and freedom is prioritized as a key tenets of their democracy. Those values don't necessarily help combat a pandemic because you need consistent cooperation and adherence to curb its effects effectively. It's easy to function as a black sheep in America and find your outlier tribe and not adhere. Australia appears to fall somewhere in the middle. It contains a society where its citizens are generally very abiding and don't hold values such as freedom and liberty as highly, thus are more compliant and trustworthy of governmental rules and directions. But at the same time, it has enough black sheep to get in the news, but not enough to storm Parliament House. And so these are my 12 lessons that I've taken away after one year of this pandemic. Now the question is, instead of complaining about the way things have gone, how can we look at the fire that has burnt through the forest and find the seeds of hope, the lessons and the opportunities that reside amongst the ashes. Where can we find the new sproutings of new life where we didn't see it before?